Hello. In this cool grad video, we're going to talk all about visas. So at this stage, I'm guessing most of you have already obtained admission to a university abroad and you've also obtained um, the forms of admission and you're all set to attend the visa interview. In this vi video, we're going to talk all about do's and don'ts while attending the visa interview. So uh, I'm just going to assume that most people are not very familiar with the visa process and if especially this is your first time attending a visa interview, I'm sure you must be having a lot of questions in your mind about how to schedule your visa interview, uh, what is the difference between an embassy and a consulate, and then you know, uh, what questions are typically asked in a visa interview, what to say, what not to say, what to do when the visa is rejected, and all kinds of questions. So I hope this video will provide you a lot of useful guidelines about the visa process. First of all, what is a passport? Well, I guess most people know what a passport is, but just in case, I'm just going to assume that you know people know very little and I'm just going to give you all the guidelines that you need to know. A passport is an official document issued by the government of a country of which you're a citizen. So it is like your national identity and it is used for, it is a mandatory document for international travel. So at any point of time, you can have only one passport from one country. You know, some people may be citizens of two different countries. They might be given an honorary citizenship, like, you know, Mother Teresa was given an honorary citizenship of some other country. So they may have two passports, but for ordinary people, at any point of time, you can have only one passport from one country. And that's usually the country of which you're a citizen. So, um, so in order to get a passport, you have to apply at the local passport office in your city. Suppose you're a citizen of India, you apply in the city in which you reside or the nearest biggest city in the Passport Seva Kendra. That's usually the passport office. And it may take anywhere from, you know, a couple of weeks to, you know, two months or more to get a passport. So usually there is a police verification check. And usually these days they're very strict about that. So the police come home and then you have to give two references like of your neighbors or people who live close by who um, can vouch for your identity. They're going to do an extensive criminal background check and make sure you don't have any uh, kind of ties with the mafia or criminal cases against you and then they give you a passport. So standard passports contain your name, your address and your date of birth, your photograph, it's like your photo identity and your signature and other verifying information. What is a visa? A visa is a document issued by a foreign country which permits you to travel to that country for a specified period of time. So it's the official approval that you mandatorily require from any other country before you enter that country. So in some countries you get a visa at the port of entry. So for example Thailand for Indian citizens and for most other people from different countries when you land there you can then apply for a visa and they give you a visa for like up to 15 days a tourist visa because you know the main uh, source of revenue for Thailand is tourism so but most of the countries don't have this you know visa at the port of entry option so visa is a conditional authorization given by a country so to a foreigner to enter and temporarily remain within the country and leave the country so there are different types of visas. Some visas are only for tourism, some are for business purposes, some are for employment. There's something called like a fiancé visa. You know, there's all kinds of different visas. So uh, just because you have a visa stamped, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can enter the country. You know, what I mean is sometimes they give you like a multiple entry visa for 10 years especially for like a tourist visa. Both my parents had multiple entry visas for 10 years. But at the port of entry of the country, like in the United States, if you're entering in New York or San Francisco, that's your port of entry. You have to go through the immigration process and they're going to ask you why you want to visit this country. And they determine how long you can stay in the country. So they either let you stay, for a maximum of 180 days, they let you stay. So sometimes they may say you can only stay for two months or sometimes they say six months, sometimes three months. So it really depends. Just because you have a multiple entry visa for 10 years, it doesn't mean you can, you know, migrate to the country and settle there for 10 years. You have to understand these details. 
what is an embassy? So embassy is a diplomatic mission and um, the head of the mission is known as the ambassador or the high commissioner. So our country, like say India, has embassies in so many different countries. There is the Indian embassy in the United States and there is the Indian embassy in France, Indian embassy in Singapore. And um, usually people refer to the embassy as the building where the diplomatic mission is working. But the embassy is not really the office building where people are working. It's really the team of diplomats. The diplomatic mission itself is the embassy and the office where they work is called the chancery. But to keep it simple, usually the embassy is in the chancery, so they call it the embassy. And if you say chancery, most people don't know what it is. So an embassy is, you know, the diplomatic mission from another country that's in your country or like say the United States, they have embassies in so many different countries. There is the United States Embassy in New Delhi and um, there may be some countries in which they don't have an embassy. For example, if a country is at war or it's um, uh, for whatever reason, they may be enemy countries or something, they may not have an embassy in that particular country. So, but most of the countries have embassies in almost every other country. And if a particular citizen of a country is traveling to a foreign country and he gets into trouble, any kind of trouble, he can contact his embassy in that country for help. So what is a consulate? So a consulate is similar to a, similar to an embassy. It's like the branch of an embassy. So it's not the same as the diplomatic office, but with a focus on dealing with individual persons and businesses as defined by the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. A consulate or consulate general is generally a representative of the embassy in locales outside of the capital city. So uh, if you are in India and you're planning to go to the US, for example, you would have to go to the nearest US consulate to apply for a visa. So if you're in uh, South India, like for example in Bangalore, they, they don't have a US embassy or in Kerala, I don't think they have a U.S. embassy. So they all go to Chennai, which is the nearest U.S. consulate for a visa. And uh, if you're in Andhra Pradesh, you would go to Hyderabad, which was a recently opened U.S. consulate. And uh, Maharashtra and uh, those areas, they go to the Mumbai consulate. And these are offices where they have a consulate general, a team of people from the foreign country, who decide whether to give you a visa or not. They do uh, other things too, so. A consulate is like, you know, a branch that helps the embassy in its mission. So for any country, there is usually one embassy in every other foreign country, but there may be many consulate offices which help the embassy. It's like distribution of labor, distribution of the workload. So embassy versus consulate. So there's usually one embassy that's usually in the capital city of the country. Like in New Delhi in India, there is the UK embassy, there's a Singapore embassy, there's the Australian embassy. They're usually in the capital city, but the consulates may be in different cities. So let's talk about India and where the embassies and consulates of different countries are located. So Embassies of UK, USA, UK, Germany, Canada, Australia, Singapore, in India, they're all located in New Delhi. US consulates, so this is the embassy which is in New Delhi and the consulates are, the US consulates are located in Mumbai, Hyderabad, Chennai and Kolkata. UK consulates for the United Kingdom located in Chennai, Kolkata, Mumbai and Goa. Canada consulates in Bangalore, Mumbai, Chandigarh and Kolkata. Singapore consulates in Mumbai and Chennai. Australian consulates in Mumbai and Chennai. German consulate in Bangalore, Chennai, Kolkata and Mumbai. So depending on your geographical location, you would have to go to the nearest embassy. It, it, each region falls under a particular you know, consulate. So you'd have to go to the nearest consulate office to get your visa. 
for the visa interview. So single and multiple entry visas. So for tourist visas especially, most countries offer multiple entry visas so you don't have to go through the procedure again and again. You know, they want to generate money from tourism. So, um, for example, the United States, for some people they give you like a multiple entry visa for 10 years. But every year you can only visit the country for tourism for at the most 180 days. That's about like six months. And if you want to stay longer, you have to get a visa extension. And at the port of entry, so usually if, you know, elderly parents are visiting their children in the U.S. Uh, on a tourist visa, first time they may let you stay for six months. And second time, depends on the mood of the immigration officer at the port of entry. They may let you stay for six months or they may let you stay only for three months or two months. You know, they try to see whether you're really going to generate revenue for them via tourism because that's what a tourist visa is all about. And uh, if you're coming on a student visa, usually the duration of the visa is the duration, the same as the length of the duration of the program for which you got admission. So if you're coming for a master's program, for two years, usually you get a visa for maybe two and a half years. Sometimes you get a visa up to five years because you may take like three years to complete your master's and you know you may uh, work on OPT for some time. Sometimes I've known people who got visas approved for up to five years for like a master's program. But that doesn't mean you can stay in the country for five years just because your visa is approved. On a student visa, you also have to have a valid I-20. And once you graduate after a certain amount of time, you have to get an OPT card or your I-20 is like no longer valid, in which case you have to leave the country. Even though the visa is stamped on the passport, it doesn't mean you can stay there. So you have to understand this. H-1 visas are for employment in the US and they may be approved for one year, two years or three years, depending on how long the client company wants you in the US. So. You can file for H-1 extension for another three years after your three-year period. So, and after that, if your green card is under process, you can, the U.S. would probably let you stay longer in this country. Otherwise, you have to leave the country. So, H-1 visa is for employment in the U.S. And some company in the U.S. has to convince the U.S. government that they're not able to get qualified Americans to do this job. And therefore, they need this Indian to come here and work for this position. So um, uh, every year you can file for a H-1 visa on April 1st. That's when the quota opens and usually the US has like about uh, 65,000 H-1 visas that they give out every year and out of which uh, 20,000 are reserved for people with a master's degree or higher. So if they receive more than 65,000 applications it goes through a lottery process. So it's just random luck. You may get it or you may not get it. But, um, and usually there's a lot of fierce competition. So if the quota opens on April 1st every year, by April 3rd or 4th, the quota is like closed. They received enough applications. So you have to, if you apply to file for a H-1 visa, you have to get all your documentation ready and have some company ready to sponsor you by, you know, end of March and keep it ready on the 1st of April, you have to go and file it. And it takes anywhere from a few weeks to a couple of months to get approved. And then by the time it gets stamped, you can only come to the U.S. in October. And if there's some H-1 visas left over, like during the recession period, I remember, they were not getting up to 65,000 uh, H-1 applications. And so some slots were left open, which would spill over to October. And some people could apply in October. So, But nowadays, there's a lot of demand for H-1 visas, and they get much more than 65,000 applications. If you have a master's degree, you fall under the special 20,000 category, which is like, which boosts your chances of getting the visa. So it's always good to have a master's degree. So different types of visas. F1 is a student visa. So if you come here on a student visa, you're not eligible for employment in this country. And uh, you're not allowed to you know, do business or things like that. It's only to be a student. And you can only work on campus. You have to know the limitations of a student visa. H-1 is employment visa. So an H-1 visa is transferable. Suppose Google in America decides to hire a person from India or some consultancy in America decides to hire a person from India. They get this person here and after working for some time, you may decide you want to switch over to another company like Microsoft. You can transfer your H-1 visa. 
it takes like a, costs a couple of thousand dollars and uh, you know it takes like, maybe a couple of weeks or a month to transfer your H1 visa. So H4 visa is a dependent of H1 visa. So it's for your spouse. Suppose the husband or wife is here on H1 visa, they can bring their dependents on H4 visa. Not necessarily spouse, but it's usually the spouse. They can bring their dependents. The dependents will not be eligible to work under normal situations on H4 visa. But nowadays they've introduced new rules like suppose the guy who's on H1 visa has already filed for his green card and he's got the, you know, um, he's cleared a certain stage called the I-140. He's got the I-140 form. So his green card is, you know, crossed a certain stage. Then his wife is eligible, to, you know, his spouse is eligible to work in this country. Or, you know, there are some other criteria like that, you know, uh, because of, you know, they want to enable their um, dependents to work. So there are certain criteria and, and only if you m match that criteria, a dependent person on a H-4 dependent visa can work in the United States. Otherwise, it's illegal for you to work. So L-1 visa, how is it different from H-1? L-1 is like if you're working for a company in India or some other country and they transfer you to their branch office in the U.S. You can only work for this company in the U.S. Like they just send you on site. So that's an L-1 visa. You can't transfer it to work for any other company. So that's L-1 visa. L-2 is like a dependent of L-1 visa. So if a person is on H-1 visa, L-1 visa, he can bring his spouse on an L-2 visa. He or she cannot work, but they can live in this country. B-1 is a business visa. It's usually given only for like two months, or 45 days sometimes. So it's for people who come here to attend conferences or, you know, trade shows or, you know, negotiate some complex deals or make presentations or it's for business. They come here for 45 days or two months and do their business and go back. That's usually a B-1 visa. So J-1 visa is for research exchange program visitors. So if you're a researcher and some university, like say, suppose you're working in DRDO in India, Defense Research um, Development Organization, or you're working for ISRO, you know, Indian Space Research Organization, and suppose like uh, NASA wants NASA in the United States, you know, they're all in, into the same kind of work, you know, they work in space technology. So suppose they want to bring someone here from ISRO on an exchange visit to exchange information and collaborate. So exchange program for research, that would he would probably come on a J-1 visa, and that's not transferable. So there are a lot of universities too where researchers get J-1 visas, and then usually they apply for a H-1 visa they ask the university to apply for H-1 visa sometimes. And if you have a PhD, you can get like a green card, you know, very easily. So, um, you know, talking about green cards, like there are three categories, EB-1, EB-2, and EB-3. So EB-1 is for PhDs and people with highly specialized skills. They can usually apply even on their own or through a university or an institution, and they can get like a green card within three to six months usually. And EB2 is for people who have a master's degree or a certain level of qualification, or like a bachelor's with this many years of experience. There are so many criteria. So if you meet those criteria, you fall in the EB2 category, usually for people with a master's degree. And they get a green card usually faster than a person with a bachelor's or lower degree. So bachelors, they fall under EB3 category and it takes much longer to get a green card. It's usually good to get a master's degree because it sets you apart from the hundreds of thousands of people who have a bachelor's degree. It sets you apart in every way. It's easier to get a visa, a green card, a job. You know, it's good to have a master's degree. So now we're going to talk about how to schedule your visa interview. So you've got your offer of admission and this might be the first time you're attending a visa interview. You may have the jitters. It's nothing to be really nervous about if you follow certain rules and guidelines and if you don't screw up. So you can schedule your visa interview slot online at the appropriate website. So just do a Google search. How to schedule US visa interview online at the Chennai consulate or at the Mumbai consulate. Just search and you'll get the website and you just go on the website and fill out all your details, your name, your address, which university you're going to, what kind of visa you're applying for 
and then you have to pay, uh, you have to fill out many forms, provide your contact details, and you have to pay the certain fees at the specified bank. Currently, as of the year 2016, for US, I mean, usually it's like the Axis Bank. At one point of time, it used to be Citibank, so it keeps changing. So, as of now, it, like it is like Axis Bank. So, uh, let's say you're living in Bangalore, then you would have to go to a particular branch of Axis Bank and pay uh, approximately, say, I don't know, somewhere around like maybe almost two hundred dollars, somewhere from one sixty to two hundred dollars. I paid recently more than like thirty thousand rupees. So, you pay this amount and get the receipt. You can also pay it online, but if you pay it in person, then within like three hours you can book a slot for a visa interview. But if you pay it online, or if you do an online money transfer through PayPal or something, then it, you have to wait for up to three days to schedule the visa interviews. So you have to look up all these details on the website. So it's better to go to the branch and pay in person. And once you get the receipt, then you fill out the form called uh, this a form called DS-160 form, you know, you, you fill out all these things and then uh, you can look up the calendar. So usually there's a wait time. You may have to wait up to like one week for the Chennai consulate to schedule your visa interview. It depends on the demand, you know, the rush at any season. Like usually uh, when it's time for students to start admission for fall semester or spring semester, there's more uh, for rush. If you're just going for a tourist visa off season, then there's not so much rush. You might get a visa slot available the very next day. So it all depends. So sometimes they may ask you to appear for biometric identification, especially if it's your first time in the visa interview. So you'll have to go one day, they just take like your fingerprints. Sometimes they may do both the biometric identification and the visa interview on the same day. Sometimes they may do it on two different days. It really keeps varying. So. One day you might have to go just for, you know, giving 10 of your fingerprints and they do all your background check, criminal check and all the stuff. And the next day you might have the actual interview. Sometimes they might have it on the same day. It really depends on the rules at different points of time and depends on the consulate. So, uh, I mean, this is how you schedule your visa interview. And remember, you have to pick a slot on the website. You have to look at the calendar and look at all the available slots. So on this day, 9.30 slot is open or 2.30 slot is open. You have to go and pick a slot and decide when you're going to go for the visa interview. So one of my cousins was um, trying to get a visa to come and he was like, I, I kept asking him, did you schedule the visa interview? And he was like, I'm waiting for an email from them. I'm waiting for the email from the consulate to, you know, he thought they were going to allot him a slot. So you have to go and pick a slot depending on your convenience and your preferences. Don't wait for them to allot you a slot. You have to go and pick a slot. So it may not be obvious to a lot of people, but so that is it. And then sometimes if you don't feel comfortable working online or if your parents are elderly, they're not comfortable uh, filling out all these applications online and scheduling it by themselves, you can pay some money to a travel agent. There are a lot of agents in most of the cities and they, for a nominal fee, like maybe 3,000 rupees or 5,000 rupees, it depends. They do this entire visa scheduling and paying the fees in the bank and uh, scheduling the slot and they do all the work for you. So you can, actually if you have like friends or neighbors or cousins or someone who can do this for you, it's actually very simple. You can do it by yourself. It's not so complicated. But if people are not tech savvy or for, if they're really busy or for whatever reason, you can sometimes use a travel agent. Or some kind of agents who do this for you for a very nominal amount so that will save you a lot of work it's quite okay to do that so can you have multiple visas at once yes you can have multiple visas at once multiple h1 visas for example so um, I think you can have up to like five h1 visas at once so it's a kind of a tricky situation or sometimes you can have a H1 and F1 visa at the same time. So that's called like, you know, working while studying. So you might be working full time, like nine to six at Microsoft. And in the evenings, you might be studying your MS in the University of Washington, for example. It's okay to, but you need a separate visa sometimes to enroll for courses. So you have to be careful about that. And you can also have multiple H1 visas. 
So sometimes a lot of consultancies, companies, they want to make sure that this person is actually going to work for them. So they take like a deposit sometimes, thousand dollars. And then once the visa is approved and the person shows up and starts working for three months, then they refund the thousand dollars. Usually that's the way it works. They want to make sure that the person is actually going to work because it costs the employer a few thousand dollars to file for a H-1 visa. And sometimes some um, students, some people are very clever. They go to multiple consultancies or multiple companies and ask them to file H-1 visa and then they pick one and they ditch the others. So you have to be uh, careful. I mean, it's, usually you don't need to apply uh, for more than one H-1 visa. Uh, like you apply and you have to just take your chances if it's in the lottery. And if you're in the master's category, you may not even go through the lottery process. Some people apply to two H-1 visas and if it's if in the lottery one is rejected, they have another H-1 visa that they can possibly get. So they do that sometimes and then, uh, you know, they get in trouble with the company. Uh, sometimes both the visas might get approved and then they ditch one company and take the other. So uh, these things happen and then they get in fights and problems, but it's not good to do that. So what do you carry to the embassy or the consulate for your visa interview? So read the instructions on the checklist of items and documents that you need to take to the visa interview. Carry only those items in a file folder. They don't allow backpacks or big bags into the consulate. They're very careful about security. So get a file folder and carry only the specified documents. They don't allow electronics in items inside the consulate for the visa interview. Like no cell phones, no laptops, cameras, camcorders. They don't even allow like water bottles or any like small items in your bag. I once had some small packets of uh, Vibhuti, you know, sacred ash in my bag. And even that, you know, they won't even let you like throw it somewhere. They have to, you have to go out and put it in a locker and pay money for the locker and then come out of the interview and then take it from the locker. It's usually good to have someone waiting outside the consulate. So remember, you have to you have a specific time for the visa interview. You have to show up there about half an hour, 15 minutes before. You know, in the earlier days, like say 10, 20 years back, it used to be like long lines outside the consulate. And um, I remember the time when my grandparents were getting a, a visa to the U.S. long back, early 1990s. They were, they, they would have uh, agents who would go wait in the queue outside the consulate at 2 o'clock in the morning and then they would be called for interview at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. If they couldn't stand, they would ask somebody else to stand in their place and things like that. Nowadays, it's all much better organized. And um, it's good to have someone accompany you and wait outside, holding your stuff, holding your belongings, you know, give you moral support. And sometimes you go there and then you go to the interview or something and, you know, they say, oh, you, you don't have this particular document or this particular printout. We need this. Maybe you can ask this person to get a printout for you and then reschedule your visa interview the next day and have an interview next day or something like that. It happens sometimes. A particular document is missing. And if you can just wait, if you, especially if you're traveling to another city for your interview, if you can reschedule your interview for like the next day or the day after and you can get these documents by just printing them out, you can probably finish your visa and then return, right? It's good to have someone there with you for moral support. And uh, so things to carry for your visa interview. Currently valid passport. So your passport is mandatory and previously cancelled or expired passports. So not to worry if you don't have them, but sometimes you get your passport renewed, you know, with a new picture or a new address and the old one is void, it's cancelled. Retain all those cancelled passports. Don't throw them away. And the same for your I-20 forms, you know. I-20 is the form given by the university. It's an offer of admission. So all your I-20 forms, in whichever university you have studied, retain them. Don't throw them away, okay? And keep a scanned copy, soft copy at least. So now carry your passport and any previously expired or cancelled passport, Keep carry that also with you. And if you don't have the cancelled passport, it's okay. They're not going to, like, deny you a visa just because you didn't have that, okay? Service receipts and I-20 form from the university. So carry all these documentations that the university has really given you an offer of admission. 
uh, invitation from the sponsoring organization in the U.S. So for graduate students, workers, and exchange visitors, this letter should include your supervisor, advisor, details about your work. Usually, the university gives you a letter saying, welcome to this university, we extend you an offer of admission, we look, look forward to seeing you, you know, that kind. So carry that letter. If you're applying for a tourist visa, like say your son or daughter is living in the U.S., they have to give you an invitation letter saying, I'm inviting my parents to come here for the, this duration. I have a house, I have enough money in my bank balance, and this I plan to show them around all these tourist parts. They have to give you an invitation letter. And if you're coming on a H-1 visa, the company has to give you an invitation letter saying, I would welcome to work in our company. I extend you an offer of job offer to work for our company. So an invitation letter from whoever you're visiting in this country, whether it's a university or your family or uh, a company, an invitation letter is important. So some more things you need to carry to the visa interview. Original marks cards from your previous educational institutions. Academic transcripts. So carry the originals. And financial statements to indicate how you will fund your education, including bank statements, education loan papers, if any. So one of the main reasons as to why visas get rejected is due to financial constraints. If the person doesn't have enough money to support himself or herself, then they probably don't want you to go to a foreign country and create problems there. So, you know, sometimes you have to show up to like sixty, seventy thousand dollars in your bank balance, even for like a master's program. Even if you have a complete funding offer from the university, for various reasons, the funding might be terminated and they want to make sure you have enough funds to support yourself financially for the entire duration of the program. This is kind of unfortunate because a lot of poor students might have their visas rejected. Look, if they have complete scholarship and funding, then it's unlikely that their visa gets rejected, but if they have full funding, but it's good to, you know, borrow money from someone and then show it in your bank balance and then return the money to them. People do this all the time. They borrow money from their friends or relatives, put it in their bank account for like three months and then get the bank statements and then return the money to them. People do this all the time. Or they get like a letter of, like a sponsorship letter from their family members or relatives or friends who say, I'm ready to support this person. It has to be attested by a notary. So. So you have to carry appropriate financial statements to show you have enough money, somebody is supporting you, or you have to support yourself. If your parents, relatives or friends are supporting you, you need to get a letter of support from them. And it's good if it's attested. Passport size photos in the required format. So make sure you have some passport size photos with you of the specified format. These days, at least in most of the US consulates, they take your picture. So. You know, you don't have to worry about that. But a few years back, you never know when the rules keep changing, right? In some consulates, they might need you to take the picture. So different countries have different formats. A particular country might want a gray background. Another country wants a white background. Another country might want a red color background. But the general rules, I'm going to talk about it in my next slide. So there's rules like you can't have your teeth showing and you can't... Um, have the hair covering your face and your ears must be shown. Like, you know, you can't have hair like that. Your ears must be prominent. So your hair must be tied up behind you. And um, uh, there's rules uh, like, um, you know, about how big your face should be in the picture and things like that. So if you go to any studio, they know about that. Carry some passport size pictures with you just in case. Anyway, in the specified format. So a resume. A resume or a CV. So that I have a separate video about the format of a resume. So write a good resume, carry a copy of your resume, and including your professional, academic background, and a list of all your publications. Statement of purpose. A detailed statement of the purpose of your visit to the US. So detail why you're visiting this country and why you want to study. Usually the same statement of purpose that you applied that you wrote at the time of applying to this university for this program, you can carry a copy of that statement of purpose with you to the visa interview. It's just helpful. So, um, if you have changed your name at some point in your life, you must have enough documentation related to name change, including birth certificate, if possible. And further instructions. All documentation must be in English for most countries. 
you should be ready to answer specific questions during the visa interview about your for the studies or research plans in the US if you're a student if you don't bring complete information to your visa interview for example invitation letter resume research summary you may have your application delayed even further or it might even be refused sometimes you if some documents are missing they ask you to reappear to the visa interview and the second time you screw up they may just reject your visa and you have to wait for a certain amount of time before you can reapply you don't want to like tick them off you don't want to annoy them so make sure you put in some effort to get all your documents ready and processing your application cannot begin until you have provided all the documentation requested at the time of the interview so what about the format of the passport size photos so for the us you know for example you go to a professional photo studio and get the photos of the correct size correct background and format it has to be like say 2 inch by 2 inch usually and usually and with a white background like for the us your hair has to be tied up behind you so that your ears are completely visible and your forehead is visible it, your hair should be covering your forehead and uh, you shouldn't be showing your teeth in the picture you can smile but not show your teeth and uh, I don't know if it's okay to for you to wear glasses or not. I am not sure about that. It depends on different countries so you can ask the studio person or the look up the instructions on the website. The face must be positioned upright in the middle of the photo and the face must be at least uh, of a certain size, you know, a certain ratio compared to the picture. Uh, you know, they have all these rules and specifications. So any studio will be able to guide you about that. So what not to carry to the visa interview? Carry only the required documents in a file folder. You are not allowed to carry backpacks or stuff. Don't carry phones, CDs, music players, camera, water bottles. These things are not allowed inside. They do extensive X-ray checks and body scans and stuff. So be very careful. Search the reach the consulate an hour in advance. The interview location may be different from the biometrics location. So I've seen this happen to some people. they go one day for the biometric identification they give their fingerprints and they assume that the next day the visa interview is going to happen in the same place especially like in the chennai consulate it used to happen it's happened to some of my friends and they don't realize that the visa interview is an, in another building sometimes it happens in different consulates it could happen it may be in the same building or different building so if you have gone for biometric identification it doesn't mean that your visa interview will be in the same building especially if it's the next day you might have to go to a different building make sure you read the address correctly so uh, pick a friendly visa officer if you can i mean this tip is uh, kind of outdated but you know rules keep changing i'm going to talk about it anyway so these days in the us consulates or a lot of consulates it's like you are given a token number and whichever window your token number is called at you just have to go to that window you don't really have a choice but a few years ago it wasn't like that and um, you know some visa officers are friendly some are cranky some are difficult people you know some ask too many questions some reject too many visas well different people have different personalities so like say 10 years back you know people would be very curious to know what kind of visa officers are in the consulate uh, suppose you are going to the mumbai consulate or the chennai consulate in the next two days so you would ask all the people who have attended the visa interview you know hey what kind of visa officers are there and they would give you information about what kind of experiences they had they would say you know there's this um, a tall bald guy white guy who's really cranky and he asks too many questions and he's very rude and he keeps rejecting a lot of visas without any reason so if you get a chance try and avoid that guy don't go to that guy is window and they may say you know there's this uh, petite young um, you know a blonde lady who's really sweet and uh, she wears glasses and she asks a lot of uh, she uh, nice questions but she uh, gives visas to almost a lot of people she's very friendly you know people talk about the personalities of the visa officers or they may say there's this uh, uh, fat lady with uh, red hair who's really cranky and uh, you know you you might not want to go to her you know things like that 
you know, you just hear all these experiences from people. At least that's what people used to do a few years ago. And then this happened to one of my uh, friends, actually. So he was in the queue. This was a few years ago. And he was supposed to go to a particular lady who was really, was known to be really cranky. And uh, this guy, he was in a line and he was supposed to go to that counter because there was a vacancy at that counter. And then what he did was, oh, you know what, I forgot something. He sent the guy behind him to that particular lady's counter. And that guy unsuspectingly went there and his visa was rejected. And this guy went to another counter where there was a visa officer who was known to be friendly and he got his visa. You know, visa officers, they don't have to give you a reason to reject a visa. And usually it's like, every day or every week they have to reject a certain number of visas you know they have their own processes they don't have to give you a reason so if you can somehow avoid going to a cranky visa officer then it might be good for you because if your visa is rejected it's going to be stamped on your passport and it's going to be there permanently for the rest of your life so i'm going to talk about some people's visa experiences and it's good to talk to people who have recently attended the visa interview. So let's say even if you have a token, I'm not asking you to try and beat the system, but if there's somebody who's not to be very cranky, you know, you might want to go and get another token or, you know, something. You know, it's not in any way trying to beat the system, but it's about trying to boost your chances of getting your visa successfully approved. In the olden days, this used to be a major concern. Um, so, well, I'm just talking about it anyway. So, if you already know the nature of the visa officers, a strategic decision can help you get your visa successfully and might, might save you from trouble. So, There's going to be some videos about people who have given visa interviews on our website and reviewing those videos might give you some insights. Uh, if, you're, if it's the first time you're going to do a visa interview, you might be kind of nervous. So it might help you and give you guidelines. There are also a lot of forums on Facebook where people you know, write texts you know, about what questions were asked, what was the nature of the uh, visa officer, what, was, what did he look like, and uh, was the visa approved or rejected. If you review those questions and answers in these forums, you'll have a better idea of what to expect at the visa interview. So many career counseling agencies give you information about the nature and attitude of the visa officers based on what other students who attended their visa interviews report. So uh, we already talked about the personalities that different visa officers might have. So I talked about this to one of my friends. He avoided, this was a few years ago, he avoided going to this cranky woman and he got his visa. Well, the poor guy behind him who went there got his visa rejected. You know, the same guy might have got his visa approved if he had gone to another visa officer. It's like a game of luck to some extent. So how to dress for the visa interview? Dress modestly, preferably in Indian business casual clothes. If you, your appearance must be decent and you convince the visa officers that you're the kind of person who will not make any trouble abroad, you don't look like a gangster, and you will return to India after your studies. That's probably a good thing for the visa officer to know. Avoid the skimpy clothes, revealing western clothes, flashy outfits, weird hairstyles, crazy piercings, gaudy makeup. Don't appear like a crazy person or a cranky person or like a potential troublemaker. Note that the visa officers are not required to give you any reason for rejecting a visa. You have freedom to dress the way you wish, but you will significantly diminish your chances of getting a visa if you dress in a crazy way. So, so factors considered to issue a visa. They would look at the university ranking and reputation. If you're going to a prestigious university, then, well, your chances of getting a visa are higher. Your financial stability, your undergraduate grades, GPA, 
integrity presentation they talk look at your presentation so so sometimes they ask you in your undergrad did you have any backlog were you able to clear all your courses don't lie about anything because they're going to look at your academic transcripts if you had a couple of backlogs say i had you know two subjects which i had failed and they cleared them the next time because i was sick or something and don't lie to the visa officers okay don't lie it's not worth it financial stability that's like one of the most important factors a lot of highly qualified students they are not able to go abroad on their own simply because their family members cannot support them financially so if you are supposed to sponsor yourself you have to show enough funds that's one of the main reasons as to why visas get rejected so it would not work in your favor to mention that you have taken an education loan unless you absolutely have to mention it i know a case like you know a few years back one of my friends he went to he had admission for a masters program he went to the visa interview and the visa officer asked him uh, uh, a lot of questions about uh, his undergraduate grades and uh, exam scores and which university he is going to and finally asked him how are you going to support yourself and this guy said uh, my parents are supporting me and they asked uh, you know how much does your father make and he showed his father's salary st slips and statements and bank balance and uh, he said in addition i have also taken an education loan he didn't have to mention that but he voluntarily mentioned that and then the visa officer asked him how do you plan to repay this loan after your studies he said i'll probably get a h1 visa and work there for a few years like no this is only for a student visa we don't want people you know who have who have to necessarily get a job there in the us to repay their loans to go there even if he had said i'm going to come back here and work for a startup company it might have been better for him but they asked him how are you going to repay your loan and he said i'm going to get a h1 visa and work there that's the only way i can repay my loan so he said no sorry and his visa was rejected so unless you absolutely have to mention it don't mention that you've taken an education loan it's better to say your best bet is that your family members are supporting you or you have funds of you know that's like your best bet i have actually known instances where people voluntarily mentioned their education loan and their visas were rejected they don't have to give you a reason to reject your visa so you just have to play it safe um uh, financial stability so people take you know people borrow money from their relatives sometimes put it in their banks for 3 months and then get the bank statements and then return it and then they tell the visa interview that you know they are sponsoring themselves their family members are supporting them these things happen all the time uh, yeah well uh your best bet is to say that you have enough funds to support yourself or your family members are supporting you so just keep that in mind so they probably also ask you what your plans are after you graduate with this master's degree or phd degree and one of the safest things to say is that you're returning to your home country and helping your country working for a startup company or working for a government organization or you know starting your own company or giving back to society helping your motherland that's probably like a safe thing to say i mean uh, i mean if you don't already have funding at the university you could tell them that you have been interacting with the professors at the university and there's a good chance they might give you funding they have given you a verbal promise although it's not in writing and uh, you can say from the second semester they promised you funding or things like that you don't have to lie but if you have been interacting and if they have given you verbal promise you can mention it so if they ask you how you plan to repay your loans or you know expenses it's good to say that you're going to come back here and work for a startup company or you know start your own company and you know say, tell them the economy in india is booming and it's good for me to come back here that's usually a safe thing to say but if you tell them you know what i want to get a h1 visa and then get a green card and citizenship they're like no this is a non immigrant visa so if you have plans like that they don't know if they really want you to go there so play safe so good command over english language so it's good to have a good presentation you 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 have to be well dressed knowledgeable and not aggressive or argumentative so 
I've seen some guys like you know who didn't know good English and that was one reason their visa got rejected. So there was one guy from Hyderabad in the consulate a few years ago and his English was really bad and he couldn't understand the American accent of the visa officer. So the visa official asked him, what was your uh, undergraduate engineering percentage? So he said uh, 69 percent and then he asked him again, uh, do you have any scholarship or funding in the university? And this guy said 69 percent. He said, no, no, no. Do you have funding, scholarship? How are you going to support yourself? And this guy couldn't understand. He said 69 percent. So he couldn't understand simple English. And either he was nervous or he couldn't understand the question. Whatever it is, you know, the visa officer said, sorry, your visa is rejected. He was not able to communicate well. This guy's like, no, 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 I will come for the visa. You have to give me the visa interview. He started arguing and creating a scene. And the visa officer rudely asked him to go away. So if it's rejected, it's rejected. You can try asking them once. Hello, please consider I really want to go. You know, it might work. But otherwise, don't start fighting with them because then they'll call security. So, Well, think about it from the visa officer's perspective. If this guy can't understand simple English for whatever reason, how is he going to survive in the foreign country? So, you know, for whatever reasons, visas could be rejected. And if you're aggressive, you argue with them, they might just reject your visa. So be very presentable, calm, and have a smiling face. So suppose you go to the visa officer with enthusiasm and like a bright smile on your face. You go like that and you say, Hi, hey, I got admission in this university and I'm excited. I want to go there, you know. He looks at the enthusiasm on your face and the smile and he might be more reluctant to reject your visa. Now think about it. It's all about human psychology. You go there with a frown on your face and say, hey, I deserve the visa and you better give it to me, that kind. He might be more inclined to reject your visa. So you go there, smile. Put on a smile and display a lot of enthusiasm and radiate friendliness and say, I'm excited. I, When it's your turn to go to the counter, remember, put on a bright smile on your face and say, Hi, my name is so-and-so and I got admission in this university and I'm really excited. I want to go there. You know, talk like that and, you, you know, you might boost your chances of getting a visa. That's it. So, integrity and clean background. So, the visa officials must feel like you're capable of successfully completing your program with a good grade. If you're being subject to any disciplinary action by former universities for violating academic integrity, the visa officials may not know about it if you're applying to another university later. Suppose, you know, it happens sometimes. A student has been at a university and he got expelled for whatever reason. Or he left the program incomplete for some reason. So, the visa officer would not know about it because it doesn't appear in your passport. So if he asks you, like, say, why did you not complete the previous program? You can say, you know, um, we had some family problems at home, parents fell sick, or I had some health problems, but this time I'm really going to do it. That might work in your, work in your favor. I mean, um, you don't really have to reveal details, like, you know, you were charged with violation of academic integrity and you got kicked out, you got expelled. Think about whether you really need to reveal that information. You don't have to lie, but you don't have to give too much unnecessary information either. So, think about it. I mean, just think about it from a visa officer's perspective. If you tell them you've been there once and you got expelled, they're probably going to think, what are the odds that you're not going to do this again? So, unfortunately, well, they're not supposed to hold it against you, but they might in all probability. So, don't give too much unnecessary information. And provide only relevant and useful information. Be honest with them, don't try to lie, but think about you know, whether a particular information is going to work in your favor or against you, whether it's really necessary to give that information. So do's and don'ts in a visa interview. Don't be argumentative or aggressive. Just answer their questions to the point don't give too much unnecessary information. Display a lot of enthusiasm. Have a good command over your English and presentation. And if they reject your visa, you say, oh, please don't do this, you know, please help me, you know. Don't get in fights and argue with them. It's just going to, like, backfire. So, 
don't get aggressive. So tourist visa do's and don'ts. So if your parents or brothers or sisters or uncles and aunts, somebody is uh, accompanying you abroad on a tourist visa or somebody is going to come and visit you on a tourist visa, then they must always mention that tourism is their primary objective. A tourist visa is for tourism. They want you to help their country generate revenue by tourism. It's not for you to go and resolve your family problems and stuff. So for example, if you're applying to a tourist visa, your best bet would be to say that you're going there, um, that you have some family members and friends there and you're going on a long trip to Yellowstone National Park and Niagara Falls and uh, New York City and um, Houston and Hawaii and you're going to see all these places. All your group of friends and family members are going there and you want to be part of this trip. That's like for tourism. So even if you have your son or daughter or somebody there, you have to talk about your interest in visiting the places in this country with your family members. Remember that a tourist visa is not for babysitting your grandkids or for helping your sick family members. Like, suppose a student had an accident in the US or some other country. And suppose the mother wants to visit her daughter to help her, things like that. If you apply for a tourist visa, they have every reason to reject it. If you tell them, you know, my daughter fell and broke her leg or something and I want to go there to help her. That's no reason for them to give you a tourist visa. Tourist visa is for tourism. So you don't have to give too much unnecessary information. You don't have to mention the accident either. So you can say, you know, uh, we have family members there and a lot of friends and we have this big long trip planned for tourism and I want to be part of the trip or there's somebody's wedding there and we're all going on a big trip after that, that's your best bet to get a tourist visa approved. So, so one of my friends uh, had her elder sister in the US and her elder sister had a baby recently. So she wanted to come here to spend some time with her sister and see the baby. So they asked her, she applied for a tourist visa and they asked her, why do you want to go to the US? And she's like, my sister had a baby, I'm going there to see the baby. Said, no, ask your sister to bring the baby to India. Reject it. Done. It's happened to a lot of elderly uh, couples too. They go there and they say, why are you going there? You know, my daughter is expecting a baby. She's going to be on maternity leave. I want to help her. That's no reason for them to give you a tourist visa. You have to tell them that you're generating revenue for their country by tourism. So keep that in mind. So um, if she had said something like, you know, my sister and brother-in-law and a lot of friends, we are going on a long trip and uh, we want, I want to be part of this trip, then a visa could have been approved. So you don't have to lie, but think about what information you really reveal. So if, you're, if you know, parents are coming to the U.S. to help their kids with their, by babysitting their grandchildren, then it's just depriving some American citizens of their jobs, of being like a nanny. So you're depriving some American citizens of their livelihood by bringing your parents here to babysit your grandkids. So they have very little inclination to give you a visa, a tourist visa. So you have to keep that in mind. So if you tell them I'm going there to be with my grandchildren or help my daughter or daughter-in-law with the delivery, then usually outright they reject it. Very rarely they approve the tourist visa. So be careful about how you present yourself. Don't give too much unnecessary information. So, um, so remember that tourist visa is for tourism and talk about tourism. So, and if you are inviting your parents or somebody else on a tourist visa to come and visit you, these are the documents that you have to give them. Give them a letter of invitation stating you're inviting them over, you have a place in which they can be accommodated, you have to give them your address and the size of your house, and you have to give them like sometimes a bank statement which says you have enough funds to support them. Usually you have to have at least $5,000 per person, so you have enough money to spend on them. And a copy of your visa or green card or US passport, if you're a US citizen, proof of your address, you have to give them a copy of your visa or green card to say that, you, first of all, you're eligible to be here in the U.S. and then you invite this person here to visit you. So that's how it works. 
So again, avoid TMI. You know, TMI is like too much information. So suppose your parents are in India and they have like three children and all of them are in the U.S. So if they're coming here to visit one particular son and daughter-in-law, they say, I'm going there to visit my son and daughter-in-law. There's this big long trip planned for tourism. Then their chances of getting a visa are better. So if the visa officer asks you, well, do you have any more children? Only then you talk about your other children. So if you tell them, yeah, I have three children, they're all in the U.S. and they're all trying to get their green cards there, then the visa officer might be more inclined to think that you're going there and trying to migrate, immigrate to the U.S. and you're probably going to settle there and never come back. That's a big fear for them. So avoid too much information. Answer to the point. And think about whether the information you reveal is going to work in your favor or against you. So you say, I'm going there to visit my son and daughter-in-law and we're going on this long trip. Okay. If he asks you, you have any more children, then you tell them, yes, I have two more children. Unless it's asked for, you don't have to reveal it and screw your chances. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Don't lie. You don't have to lie. But think about what information you reveal voluntarily. So if you have your own house in India, a stable job or a pension or enough bank balance and if you have commitments in India to take care of, then your chances of getting a tourist visa are better. You tell them, you know, you don't have own a house in India, you don't have any family in India and all your people are there, then they're more inclined to think you're probably going to migrate to the US, right? And they want to probably prevent that on a tourist visa. So if you have a house back in India and you show them house documents, your bank balance and you say you have your you know parents to take care of or something like that then your chances of getting a tourist visa are probably boosted you can extend a visitor visa over six months so you know at most you can stay for 180 days on a visitor visa but I've known people like they could extend it for various reasons like health reasons or because they could not visit enough tourist spots for some reasons, you can extend your tourist visa and they may not hold it against you if you have a valid extension. So, it has usually no penalty or impact on their future visits to USA if they decide to do so. But if they extend it without, if they overstay without a valid extension, then the next time they plan to come, it's going to be a big problem. So, the extension requests are filed with the USCIS, that's the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services along with the cover letter saying clearly the reason for extension. So usually they grant extensions without much fuss. Sometimes they may make a fuss. Fill out the I-539 form at this website, USCIS.gov. Search for Form 539 and fill it out. And you can explain the letter, pay the applicable fees, and they may give you an extension. So don't wait till the last minute to file for visa extension if you need to. Like, you know, one of my friends, she was able to extend her visitor visa for her parents without any hassles because she just mentioned that, you know, she lived in Seattle and she asked them to extend her parents' visa because the parents could not visit a lot of tourist spots because of the harsh winter. She said she could not take them to Niagara Falls and Alaska and New York and, you know, Michigan and so many other places because of the harsh winter. So she wanted them to stay for a few more months in the summer and the visa extension was granted. So, um, if you're planning to get a new I-94, so I-94 is the form that tells you your date of entry to the US and the date on which you leave the country. I-94 is given at the port of entry. So, if you try to get a new I-94 without filing for extension or by going to Canada or Mexico, it won't work. You have to travel outside of North America so outside of Canada and Mexico for at least 30 days before a new I-94 gets issued. And then the maximum you can stay on a visitor visa is one year. So don't request extension more than for six months. So they give you 180 days and you can at the most extend it by another 180 days, I guess. So don't try to ask for more extensions than that. So this brings us to the end of this uh, video about visas. And I hope you have enough information about 
how to schedule your visa interviews, what to say, what not to say, what to carry to the visa interview, different types of visas and things like that. And I wish you the very best of luck to get your visa successfully approved. Thank you.